Street Knowledge with Chris Graham. Let's talk some Washington Nationals baseball. Hello, Chris Graham with you here on the podcast. It is Monday morning as I'm recording this. It'll be Monday afternoon by the time you get to hear it. And tonight, game three in D.C. at Nats Park. 738 first pitch in Washington with a 2 nothing lead on St. Louis in the National League Championship Series, the NLCS. After a pair of weekend wins, well, Friday, I, I count Friday night as a weekend, certainly. Friday night and Saturday night, uh, well, Saturday afternoon, a uh, 2 nothing win in Game 1 as Annabelle Sanchez goes no-no for seven and two-thirds innings. Sean Dillow gets the last four outs. And then Game 2, Matt Scher- Max Scherzer goes six innings. I think it was six exactly, six plus, if you want to say. Leadoff hitter in the seventh got a base hit, but just gives up the one base hit. Nats eventually win that one 3-1. Uh, getting some help from the bullpen, uh, and, uh, and and so now after uh, two no hitters carried into the seventh inning or beyond by Nats pitchers, it's now up to Jack Flaherty to keep St. Louis in this series. The Cardinals losing the first two at home in Bush Stadium, and uh, well, if you if you have to put your your uh, season on the line with anybody, if you're St. Louis, you certainly don't mind it being Jack Flaherty. You look at his season numbers and you say good numbers, 11 and 8 record, 2.75 ERA, uh, walks and hits the innings pitched of, of 0.97, 10.6 strikeouts per nine. Those are good numbers, but you look at his numbers in the second half since the All Star break. All Star game was July 9th. Second half plus the playoffs. Well, the, the, the second half numbers first, 7 and 2 record in, in the regular season. Second half, 0.91 ERA, 0.71 WHIP, 11.2 strikeouts per nine. And a slash line, that's that's batting average, uh, one base percentage, slugging percentage, slash line of 142, 208, 217. Those are like left-handed pitcher, one-out guy numbers, uh, what do they call them, loogies. Uh, lefty, one-out guy, uh, uh, that's, uh, that's, 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 those are absurd numbers. For a starting pitcher who pitches six, seven innings a game, in 17 starts, including two in the NLDS, uh, he didn't give up more than three runs in any of his starts. Gave up three runs in just three games, and in one of those games, actually, just two earned runs. So, and then he also didn't give up a run in eight of his 17 starts, dating back again to the All-Star game this year, back July 9th. That's a long time ago. Uh, it was a lot warmer than it is today, <laughs> among other things. He did take the loss in Game One of the NLDS to Atlanta, but he, he gave up three runs in seven innings. There, he gave up a two-run homer in the seventh inning, went 117 pitches in that 3-0 loss. Certainly, if you get some help there uh, from his offense, uh, it's a different situation. He did rebound to win Game Five. Hard to say that he was the key in that one. That's the game that the Cardinals had the 10-0 start in the top of the first, all the way on the way to a 13-1 win. So, uh, but those are the numbers for Flaherty. He's the guy going tonight for the Cardinals. Uh, we'll talk about Steven Strasburg, who's going for the Nats in a second. Um, just wanted to look at Nats hitters versus Flaherty. I like to break this down when I talk about a game uh, going in, uh, uh, and, and you know, it's usually <laughs> usually have a lot more uh, to talk about, and we will with Strasburg against Cardinals hitters coming up later. But uh, not a lot here because Flaherty's only in his second full season as a starter. He had a couple starts back in 2017. I say a couple, maybe it was five or six. Uh, last year's first full season as a starter. This year's second full season as a starter. Uh, and he has just one career start against the Nats, and it was way back in 2018, September of 2018. And he had uh, he gave up one run on three hits in five innings in that start. So it's and it's hard to extrapolate anything really from a start over a year ago for a young pitcher who's really come into his own. In the second half of this season, uh, the Nats hitters are just 5 for 21. I say just. It's not a bad average, but just 21 at-bats collectively by Nats hitters. Trey Turner hit a home run in that 2018 game. Uh, Anthony Rendon doubled, and that's, that's the extent of what we know. That's not a lot there. Uh, I'd say, generally speaking, a starting pitcher uh, who's never really faced a team, and, and I, I, I would almost count this as never really having faced Flaherty. Starting pitcher, certainly the first time through the lineup should have the advantage. Um, if not, you know, even the second time through, because you're still figuring this guy out. Cardinals hitters have a, a history against uh, Strasburg, uh, just because Strasburg's been around for a while, and the Cardinals have obviously been around for a while, right? Uh, and uh, Strasburg pitched twice against St. Louis this year. He got the win back in May, uh, May 2nd start. He gave up a run on six hits and six and two thirds, struck out nine, walked two. Uh, and he pitched most recently in September 16th. You know, the Nats played. 
uh, a three-game series in St. Louis back in the middle of September. Uh, lost two of the three. They actually lost this game. Strasburg got a no decision. Didn't go very far. 99 pitches in five innings. He walked four. Gave up two runs on three hits. Uh, I remember that game pretty well. Watched that game pitch for pitch. Uh, and Strasburg struggled not as much with the strikes, and he did walk the four, which is you know obviously an indication of something. But also Cardinals hitters just really uh, doing a good job of, of working at bats, working counts, and uh, kind of a little bit of what they did better in game two against Steven Strasburg, uh, excuse me, because Max Scherzer. Uh, game one against Sanchez. Sanchez was uh, at around 11, 10 or 11 pitches per inning all the way through. He, he, he got taken out. I think it was the 100th pitch or so, maybe 100, 101 pitches uh, with two outs in the eighth when he gave up that hit. Uh, finally, the, the first hit of the game, uh, I believe that was Jose Martinez who had that hit. Uh, the pinch hitter. Uh, he, he, he was very efficient, uh, Sanchez was. Uh, Scherzer was a little a little further along. Um, I want to say the first inning, he was around 18, 19 pitches, uh, and he kind of stayed, uh, hovered in the 15 pitch per inning range. He was around 100 pitches as well, but only went to seven. I say only seven. Seven. <laughs> if you get seven out of Strasburg tonight, I think you'll be very happy if you're Davey Martinez. Uh, but, uh, yeah, Strasburg struggled in that start back uh, in, in September about a month ago uh, and only was able to go the five innings with 99 pitches. Cardinals hitters put up good numbers collectively, and I'll tell you in a second, it's a little deceptive, but collectively a 279, 336, 419 slash line uh, and 36 hits and 129 at-bats. But then you look at it, and a lot of those hits and a lot of those at-bats actually too, Marcelo Zuna, former Marlin, so he's, you know, got a, uh, a former long-time Marlin. So a lot of at-bats for Ozuna, 14 for 44. Uh, pretty good slash line, 318, 348, 591. That's a, an OPB or, o, excuse me, o, OPS of, what would that be, uh, 909. So that's, that's pretty good OPS. Three homers, a triple, a double, nine RBI for Ozuna against Strasburg in those 44 at-bats. But you take those numbers out, and you know, you can do the quick math on that. That'd be 22 for 75, much more manageable if you're uh, if you're Strasburg. Uh, and the success for other guys in the lineup, modest. Uh, only four guys I could count with uh, that I saw in the in the matchup who have career 10 at bats or more uh, against Strasburg, and and none of them are really outstanding, if you want to say. Paul Goldschmidt maybe the most so, six of 23. Uh, a 261 batting average, 261, 370, 341 slash, uh, two doubles, three RBI, five strikeouts as well. Dexter Fowler and Yadier Molina, both three of 11 uh, against uh, uh, Strasburg. Matt Carpenter, four of 18. And so, in fact, this lineup has uh, this lineup has three home runs uh, against Strasburg, and they're all three by Ozuna. So. One guy to, to worry about if you're a Nats fan in the lineup, really, uh, and that would be Ozuna. You get through Ozuna, and you're, you know, you you feel good. I mean, not to say anything else. The strategy going in. I mean, I, I like to go over this uh, from the Nats' perspective on a regular basis. Strategy going in is probably not a lot different. You know, we we all know that the Nats have the the league's worst bullpen. That's not going to change uh, in in the playoffs. Your roster is what your roster is. Uh, the uh, the Nats with the worst bullpen ERA in Major League Baseball this year, worst uh, bullpen opponents batting average in Major League Baseball this year. I haven't seen a bullpen slash, but I imagine it's even worse. If it be, if it could be worse than the worst, it would be worse. Uh, but you know you you don't worry about that because you don't need to use your whole bullpen. Theoretically, you don't. You know, if you get into your B bullpen, that's a sign of something else. It's it's. You, you, you focus on the, the, the two guys, really, that you really want to see if you're Nats fans. Obviously, Doolittle, uh, Sean Doolittle, and Daniel Hudson. And it's uh, there was a lot of talk. In fact, I watched the Sports Junkies on, on uh, uh, the TV simulcast this morning on, on Masson. It's actually on NBC Sports Washington. I watched it on uh, the Sports Junkies, the 106.7 uh, guys up in D.C. Uh, and it seems like from the guys they were talking to, the analysts they were talking to, Tanner Rainey is interesting. He's, he seems like he's kind of pitched his way uh, a little higher up the chain. Uh, he might be the first guy out of the bullpen if you have to use somebody before Doolittle or Hudson. Uh, I think we saw that back in Game 5 of the NLDS. Uh, got a couple of important outs. 
you can't use tonight. You can't use uh, uh, Patrick Corbin like you've had the ability to use Corbin uh, in a in a couple of um, a couple of uh, recent outings. In fact, Corbin's only started one game so far in these playoffs. The Nats are now in what uh, game? This will be game nine of the playoffs. Just the way things worked out uh, because of the way the regular season ended, and then needing to you know get through the series the way they did. He started game one of the NLDS. Uh, and then uh, because he was used in relief a couple of times in the NLDS, uh, he, he's not going here until game four. He's scheduled to go tomorrow for the Nats. Uh, but uh, Corbin has been used – now he, of course, was used once in game three of the NLDS and gave up six runs in two-thirds. And then he just couldn't get the third out. He had two outs, two strikes, one guy on base, nobody in uh, in the sixth inning, I believe, of that game, uh, of game three, and just couldn't get the outs. Uh, couldn't get the last out. Couldn't get the last strike. Had a couple of two strike counts on hitters in in, in that game, uh, and eventually gave up the six runs. But uh, Corbin was effective uh, in a couple outings since in relief, uh, and uh, in, including uh, getting a big out uh, uh, in game three uh, for uh, the Nats uh, when uh, Scherzer went seven. And uh, so, but you, he's not going to be available tonight. Uh, there was talk uh, in, in the on, in the off-day press conference, uh, going to my Nats notebook here, uh, about lefties in the pen and availability. Uh, Yo uh, Rowanus Elias, remember him? Uh, uh, he's on the roster, and he was, you know, Daniel Hudson and, and Elias were the two. Uh, I should say Elias. I'm not. I'm not talking about the WWE guy. Uh, Rainus Elias. Uh, <laughs> uh, they were the two. They, they were the two trade deadline guys picked up by Mike Rizzo. Uh, Hudson obviously has become the closer for this team. Uh, Elias was expected to be a guy that would really add depth at the back end of the bullpen. And just weird situation. His first appearance with the Nats was August 2nd. So the trade deadline was July 31st. His first appearance was August 2nd. And just because of a quirk, uh, he was brought into a game, I think, in the seventh inning, and I can't think who, were, who the Nats were even playing then uh, that night. But uh, he was brought in in the seventh inning, and then uh, the, the Nats were short on the bench that night, uh, and it just happened that his, his spot in the lineup came up. So they weren't – Davey Martinez unable to double switch, and uh, he sent Elias up to the plate and basically said to him, he's under orders, don't swing the bat. Uh, I believe Elias got a 3-1 count. Uh, maybe even a 3-2 count, and uh, put the ball in play. And he, as he put the ball in play, it was a sort of a weak ground ball. Uh, he tried to beat the throw out, and in trying to beat the throw out, he he, uh, he strained his hamstring. Uh, and uh, as a result, he's only pitched three times since August 2nd. So he's pitched four times as a net. And the last appearance is all the way back on September 5th. Uh, but but uh, Martinez said yesterday that Elias would be available uh, out of the bullpen. And uh, with, with Corbin not... You know, the, the Nats' one weakness has been uh, the lack of lefties in the pen. Uh, and that's why you've seen Corbin used three times in relief in the playoffs to this stage. Uh, because the only other lefty in the pen is, is Sean Doolittle. And Doolittle has, has been a closer. He, in fact, he got, the, he got the save in game one. He pitched some important outs uh, in, in game two. And so, uh, you know, he's not a lefty situational guy. And uh, he, he's you know, a Doolittle. I haven't looked at the numbers to, to be able to back this up, but you know, just from observation in the last couple of years, he's you know he seems to be equally uh, uh, effective against lefties and righties. In fact, I might be able to bring those numbers up while I'm talking if I filibuster long enough on this. Um, let's see. But uh, so you, you you don't use Doolittle the same way uh, that. You use a, a lefty situational guy. And Elias is probably he probably is more of a lefty situational guy. So, um, so I'm trying to bring this up now. But uh, so Elias, is, you know, Martinez did talk about Elias being available uh, out of the pen tonight, and and that you know it's, the way he talked about him being available was more than just that he's available, but that he's a guy that that you'll actually uh, you know you might see in a key situation tonight, um, you know, for a one out kind of thing. Um, so I'm trying to get up here now. Let's, let's see if I can get this. Oh, yeah, I got a new roster here. Boy, just uh, bear with me for a second because I want to see if I can either prove the point or disprove the point that I was making about Sean Doolittle being equally effective righties and lefties. It just feels to me, you know, his fastball and his slider really work better maybe against uh, better against uh, righties, in fact. 
maybe not quite as much as Corbin, but let's see. Yeah, let's see, righty lefty. Okay, so yeah, I'm wrong on that. His uh, average, average yeah, batting average, 279 against righties, 221 against lefties. So yeah, it could be it. That Doolittle is more effective there, but uh, let's see. Even improving anything right here? I don't have a anything right here. 43 strikeouts, 165 bats, 23 strikeouts, 77 bats. Yeah. So actually, yeah, yeah, Doolittle is a little more effective this year, at least against against uh, lefties. So, um, but uh, yeah, Eli Elias, uh, uh, Elias, Elias. <laughs> I'll get that right eventually. Uh, Ronis would be the harder name to pronounce, I think. Uh, but yeah, so so El uh, Elias might give you a second lefty out there. Um, but again, the game plan, if you're the Nats, uh, you know, the best game plan, if you're the Nats, I guess you could say, would be Strasburg gives you seven innings. And if he gives you seven, you know, Doolittle can, can, can work the eighth, maybe a combination of Doolittle and Rainey, um, and then Hudson in the ninth. I mean, actually, I say that depending on the, the, the part of the order that comes up for the cards, uh, and I, that's the flexibility that, that Martinez has uh, with – I, I, and I know that that Hudson has become the closer, uh, you know, quote unquote. But um, when you have a righty and a lefty as sort of co-closers, uh, and the fact that Doolittle does have a save in the last couple of days, uh, you know, you could you could situationally go if 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 it's the, you know, more the righty part of the lineup coming up for the cards, you go with him in the eighth. Uh, you know, and if you, if it was more the top of the order where Colton Wong uh, is part of that mix, you could certainly go Doolittle. Uh, in, in the eighth as well. So, in any case, uh, you know, if if Strasburg is able to give you seven, that's the best case scenario. Uh, if you're Dave Martinez, uh, if you go six, you know, you got to examine these possibilities here. I guess if you go six, you're definitely going to need to have Rainey. You you definitely probably need to have Elias available. You may need to have Rodney, uh, Fernando Rodney also available uh, to you out of the pen. Uh, and uh, you know, you, you, the, the a key here then will also be getting, you know, perhaps working Flaherty a little longer than Flaherty wants to go. He did go 117 pitches in his game, uh, one start in the NLDS. Uh, didn't have to work quite as hard in that 13-1 win because he had a 10-0 lead in the first inning. He did go six innings, and I, I remember watching that game. And yes, I'm that much of a baseball obsessive that I watched that entire 13-1 game. Uh, I do remember the talk. Uh, I believe Ron Darling was working that game uh, for. Uh, TBS, and there was a lot of talk during that game about, uh, you know, hey, do you shut him down? I mean, you know, in, in the fourth inning, as early as the fourth inning, there was talk about, do we shut him down and give him, you know, chance to, he, he doesn't need to throw these, use these bullets, basically. Uh, and he was he was left back out there for a couple more innings. So, uh, but, so you know, if you can work him a little bit, uh, maybe wear him down. It's going to be a chilly night in D.C., uh, not quite as chilly as it was on Friday night in in uh, St. Louis, but uh, you know you do have uh, it will be 65 degrees at game time. It'll be in the, in the mid 50s, uh, you know, as we get into the middle innings of that game. So a colder night, uh, perhaps that has some impact uh, on the game. And uh, the Nats with a chance, a chance. If you go up 3-0, you got to feel good about your chances. Only one time in postseason history in MLB has a team blown a 3 nothing lead. That was the New York Yankees, obviously, back in the ALCS in 2004. Um, it's a must-win for St. Louis tonight. They do have their best pitcher on the hill. Uh, if, if you're the, the Nats, you've got all the, you know, the you got your best pitcher right now on the hill in Steven Strasburg. Uh, uh, career ERA in the 1-4s in the postseason. And, um, you know, a chance to put some pressure on the Cardinals. If you if you can get a couple runs early, you got Strasburg out there. Uh, you definitely put the pressure on the Cardinals. Maybe you'd have to pinch it for Flaherty uh, in the middle of the game if you get the lead, and he comes up in the fourth or fifth inning with a chance uh, to, you know, to maybe put some runs on the board. You may you may see a uh, an early hook just for offensive purposes. You, you to some degree, if you're the Cardinals, you do have to kind of think about playing this like it's a game seven, because. You know, because of that history, because only one team's ever come back from a 3-0 deficit, if you happen to fall behind a couple runs in the early innings, you do have to think about making more guys available on your staff. Uh, you know, yeah, obviously Flaherty still gives you, even even if he's down, say, 2 nothing in the third or fourth inning, Flaherty on the hill gives you a better chance to win the game down the road. But, again, if you, if you have, say, first and second and one out or, you know, something of that nature where he can't have a productive out with a bunt to get guys in scoring position, uh, and you have to think about, 
do we want to think offense here, or do we want to, you know, perhaps give up a chance at a, a a comeback with with a potential you know pinch hit base hit or something like that? I mean, there are there are some situations there that can definitely play tonight in this game. So that is again that's game three tonight, 7:38 first pitch, and uh, we will have uh, more today on Augusta Free Press. Uh, I'll be monitoring the pregame pressers with both uh, uh, teams, the, the Nats and the Cardinals, for any updates. Uh, one update I did want to give, I talked about the lefties in the bullpen. Victor Robles, uh, he's apparently continuing to be evaluated. That's you know, that whatever word that is, that is the word. Uh, Robles, the, uh, the the starting center fielder, hasn't played since game two of the NLDS. Michael A. Taylor's played well in his absence. Uh to a, to a great degree. He's 6 for 20 in the postseason. He had a home run in game two. He did misplay a ball in the eighth inning, but that's just what it was. It was a ball that sort of took off on him right at the end there. Actually led to a run and sort of a knuckly situation there. Uh, Doolittle got out on the next pitch, but uh, Taylor has played well in the stead of, of Robles. Martinez, uh, David Martinez did indicate, though, that if Robles is healthy, he will start. Uh, and apparently they're going to uh, put him out today, uh, put him through batting practice, uh, try to have him do some fielding, uh, see what you know, see what the situation is. Do you want to play him at 100%? Martinez did did emphasize that that, you know, you're not going to just put him in the, because Taylor's playing so well. Uh, that if Robles is still at 80% or or some number below 100%, uh, that you'll probably still see Michael A. Taylor. Uh, we have we've not even seen Robles pinch hit, which is interesting. Uh, you know, considering the short shortened bench that you have in the postseason. Uh, but uh, yeah, Robles. Robles uh, is is maybe closer to playing, but uh, it, it. I read. <coughs> excuse me. I read into uh, Martinez's comments that probably not. That uh, you know, if you can get if you can get through another game with Michael A. Taylor in center field again because he's playing well, uh, and you don't have to push a hamstring injury with a guy who is a, a big part of the effectiveness of Victor Robles is his speed on the base paths out of the batter's box, out in center field, and you do have, again, a very viable option at Michael A. Taylor, uh, who's playing very well right now, is also generally a, a, a elite center fielder uh, 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 defensively, uh, and who right now is hitting well and is, is contributing offensively. Uh, you don't need to rush Robles back. Uh, if you can win, you know, if you can win this series here in D.C., there's, you know, three scheduled games in D.C. Uh, tonight, tomorrow, and Wednesday. If you can win this game, these, you know, win two of these next three in D.C. and in this series. Uh, you don't play again until I think it's next Tuesday's when the uh, the uh, World Series would start. If you get that far, uh, you know, that's another week for Robles to get better, and you would presume that he'd be better in a week if he's 80% now. So, um, so no need to rush him back. And uh, but that is the latest on Robles. But we'll monitor the the, the pregame presser. That should be sometime middle afternoon. And uh, any updates, we'll post uh, a, a Nats notebook on AugustaFreePress.com uh, to share the latest. Then, of course, post-game coverage tonight uh, after the game. Sometime probably. I mean, these games have been going three, three and a half hours. So sometime, probably before midnight, we'll have uh, a recap of game three and get you ready for game four. So thank you for listening to our podcast. Now we have a couple more coming up today. Uh, I'll be talking with Scott German uh, coming up uh, as I'm I'm recording this now. It's just it's we're, we're getting just to around noon on Monday, at around two today I'll be talking with Scott German. We'll have that podcast up. We'll be talking some UVA football, a lot of UVA basketball. Scott covered the uh, UVA basketball inter squad scrimmage. Want to get his thoughts on the the team? He's seen the the new look defending national champion Wahoos. Uh, and, uh, and with his own two eyes, I uh, want to get his impressions on on that. Uh, and then at three o'clock, talking with Jerry Carter, we'll do a, we'll probably talk some Nats, we'll probably talk some UVA football and basketball, ACC football, uh, and, and and other things in sports too. So a lot more coming up on podcasts today, and a lot more coming up just in general on Augusta Free Press. And want to thank you for listening, and please check us back out uh, as the day goes on. And it's a big day in sports, and I uh, want to thank you for listening. Have a great day, everyone.